Hello and welcome to The Business. I'm your host Nizar Ashraf and The Business is the newest talk show about right now. My hope is that I can provide you guys with warm, intriguing and relatable content that will motivate something on the inside of you. So today I've got my first guest on the show, it's Nancy Baker. She's someone I've known from a very young age since I was a little boy and she has literally always been into football. We've always had a passion for football. And yeah, I'm just very, very just happy to be sitting here with you right now. I've not seen you in ages. I know, like, I think it's been actual years. It's been time. Yeah, it's been so long. But as, as I said, like, I'm so privileged to be here and to be your first guest as well. Hopefully we, we give it a really high popping start and it just continues from there. I hope so, man. <laughs> I hope so. But the same way that you're saying it's a privilege is the same way that I just feel like it's a privilege from myself as well, because when you're just starting out something and you're just in the execution process and trying to get things off the ground, you want to see people who really just believe in you and believe in your vision. And yeah, so just thank you for even being here right now, because this is just the start. Do you know what I'm saying? Yeah, 100 percent. I I completely agree with what you're saying, like with what I've been doing in terms of my work that I'm probably most recognisable for, mm. I still feel like I'm still really, really scratching the surface and I've mm. not actually show, shown who I am yet. Mm. But there's always space to grow and there's always room to make sure you can bigger and better yourself. So mm. where you're saying you have a privilege of me being here, I just feel privileged that you've asked me to even be here, honestly. Well, thank you, man. Thank you. <laughs> um, okay. So um, in terms of just the growth and everything and how you even got to how you are now, what is it that you kind of do and keep up with to even just be in the spaces you are now? Because I understand that you've always been into women's football, but how I kind of see you just through what I've seen is, and I know you probably don't identify yourself as this, but you're kind of like a sports journalist to some extent. To some extent, yes, but I genuinely do not think I am talented enough to be classed as a sports journalist. When I think of journalists, I think of someone who's writing, who, mm. whose work's being covered and being rejigged about and having someone to overlook it and edit mm. it. And honestly, I am awful at English. So I genuinely wouldn't class myself as a sports journalist. I think what they do is incredible, mm. and I'm, but I'm not in that bracket, and that's not an offensive thing, it's just me not being great at English. I, don't, I think I'd be doing journalists an injustice saying I was one. Do you know what it is though? Sometimes, sometimes you get into certain spaces and you don't even feel like you're qualified for it. <laughs> and I think you've definitely gone a very way, and I know there's so much more to come. But just in terms of you like being able to get passes into all these different matches and just the connections that you do have, it's like you're kind of, how I see it is, you're kind of a pillar when it comes to the women's game. Um, and it's all about that kind of networking. And something that I always say is, you know, your net worth is your network or the other way around. How have you managed to continue to network with people who can push you to places that you never ever saw yourself going? Yeah, 100% agree with what you're saying. Like When I go into a room, the first thing I do is greet someone and smile and say, hi, I'm Nancy. Whether that be like a hug, a handshake, just sort of give a welcoming introduction to myself and hopefully people feed off my energy and mm. think, oh, that's a nice girl. Like She's given me a smile, she's greeted me, she's made herself known. And then I sort of lead into it by just talking to someone, maybe asking, oh, where are you from? Do I, do I know you mm. from somewhere? If I think I know someone who looks familiar, might not know someone. But it's all about taking a genuine interest. I'd like to think that when people meet me, they would like to approach me and know about me. Mm. And that's exactly what I want to do. If I walk into a room where I don't know anyone, there is no reason for me not to approach yeah. them and not introduce myself. Because knowing my luck, where I've grown up in my area, I know someone who knows someone who mm. knows my mum or knows my dad. Yeah, it's mad. So yeah. the likelihood of knowing someone who knows me is so small. And sometimes it just happens that someone knows someone that we know. Mm. So I think with networking, it's so important because that person you network with and meet could pull you up five months down the line and say, hey, Nancy, I remember you. I remember you've got an interest in this, this and this. I like your energy. I'm it's doing crazy. this. Yeah, yeah. It's crazy, you know, because even just with networking, it's those first impressions yeah. that are always going to leave with people. That's what people are going to be left with. 
what was that person like the first time I met them? And that's something that I always remember, yeah. the point that I first met someone. Um, so in terms of everything, in terms of what you did when you were younger and stuff, what led to you being to where you are now? How has that progressed over time? For me, it's always been a passion and a love. Mm. With me, I always say I could literally play football before I could ride a bike or swim. Mad. I genuinely have loved football my whole life and I've been so blessed to have people around me who support that, whether that be my mum, mm. my dad, my nan. They're probably the three people in my life who have always supported me. So the fact of they've allowed me to explore and to work and to be within my passion mm. at all times throughout my life, whether that be my GCSE selections, they allowed me to pick PE. They said, do what makes you happy. So I yeah. got to do PE, art and geography. When I went to university, I said I wanted to study sport. They took me to universities to go and view them. They drove me, we got mm. the train together. They said, pick what makes you happy. Mm. When I said I wanted to be a football coach, you're good at it, put me on courses or connect me with people who are doing stuff that I want to be doing. It's all about the support that I've had and I know I'm so lucky to have that because not everyone does. Yeah. And I, so, I so say to myself now, everything I do, I do for them. Yeah. So I think having a support system around you that does go beyond those three people. Mm. Like everyone has always supported me. Again, so, so lucky to have that, but it just empowers me and really makes me want to continue and be the best that I can so I can give back. Yeah, that's, that's, that's banging because you know, the support system is something that you just thrive off. And I know that a lot of people growing up, it's been the opposite story because as you're growing up and you're developing, you realise that your career aspirations change to some extent. So even though you knew that, you know, you were into football, there's different things within football that you've put your foot in. So you've been able to dibble and dabble in different yeah. places. But there's so many people where their story is, I want to do this today and maybe in a few years I want to do that. And they aren't supported in that area. So I really just believe that, you know, the support system for you is definitely a massive thing because had you not had a support system like that, how different do you think things could have been in terms of you just aspiring and having that go-getter mindset with everything you're doing now? Yeah, I, it would have been difficult mm. because you've got to think, I wanted to be a footballer. I've always loved playing football, but I couldn't take myself to Fulham Mm. Fulham as in in Fulham in Surrey that's where okay. the Fulham setup used to be so right. when I was 12 eight years old between that age group I couldn't drive myself there or I couldn't get a train there by myself at that age I I depended on my family to mm. my mum and my my dad to get me there so if I didn't have those people supporting me and helping me I genuinely wouldn't have been able to be present mm. because I wouldn't be able to get there so I don't think I would have found a way because at eight years old, if your parents tell you no, or yeah. 12 years old, I can't remember the exact age, they tell you no, you, you don't really have any control over that. Mm. I can't just ring someone up. I didn't have a phone at the time, so I can't ring someone <laughs> up and be like, can yeah. you take me to football? Yeah. So it would be interesting because if they didn't allow me to play football and to explore it, especially being a female, I've mm. grown up my whole life playing with boys, which yeah. I adored. Yeah. Because I feel like I'm a strong player. Yeah. Even though I'm really small, I'm strong, I'm brave. Because playing against boys, they didn't want me to have the ball. So I had to win it and make sure I stood my ground. In terms of playing with boys and, you know, being in different educational institutions or after school clubs where you're playing football, how have you felt in terms of just being supported from, I guess, the coaches and, you know, the managers in those kind of areas? Because I know that just from, just from like, general knowledge that it seems like men are more supported in this area when it comes to just having that backing yeah. in terms of football. How has that felt? Again, in schools, so when I was younger, my teachers loved that I played football. My friends loved that I played football. Like, I'd always try and get my girl mates involved and mm. if they got involved was another <laughs> story. But yeah. some of them didn't, some of them didn't. But I've always had that support from my friends as well. The boys used to pick me over other boys. Mad. Which some people, <laughs> no, but some people will tell you that never, ever happened to them, yeah. even if they're a good player. But I had boys who literally, I remember going to secondary school and showing the boys that I could do kick-ups and having the older boys in like year 11 saying, Nancy, like she's a baller, she can play football. Then showing she's a baller. Yeah, and then showing the boys <laughs> yeah. and stuff. And we'd have like lunchtime football and the boys were like, come on Nancy, come and play. Or 
I remember one of the boys at one stage asked our teacher if I could play on the boys' football team. That's so mad. And it wasn't because that happens as well. it wasn't because oh she's a girl. It was because Nancy's a good footballer. She's better Talented. than some of the boys. We want we want her on the team. Yeah. 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 So even just in that area, okay. So how do you think that sports and playing football helps young girls develop? I think it empowers you. I when I played football, I always felt empowered. I felt happy and. Most importantly, I felt free mm. and I felt really safe. And going back to the words that I'm using, I probably was privileged to feel that because some girls don't. Yeah. Maybe some boys don't feel that who maybe aren't at the top of the pick when you're playing for a football team and you're getting picked maybe fifth, sixth, seventh. But for me, I was always able to really be myself and mm. explore myself and explore what I wanted to do and why I wanted to play. I just loved it and it made me mm. happy. And that kind of moves on to my experiences of being happy and feeling safe and being able to just have fun mm. is one of the reasons why I'm doing some of the stuff I'm doing as a passion project, like outside the box. I want to, the feelings that I had and the happiness I had, I want to be able to pass that on. Yeah. And unfortunately, we're in a space right now where opportunities for young people are limited. Mm. And whether that be because of their background whether it be because of their race, whether it be because of their financial situation or their access to transport. There's so many different barriers in place. And for me, growing up in London, I've always been around people of different cultures, different mm. backgrounds, et cetera, et cetera, which I absolutely love because I feel like it made me grow as a person. Yeah. I love learning about cultures. I love learning about people. And I don't, I don't limit myself because of what someone is or someone mm. isn't. And again, football is a space for me where I was allowed to explore that. I played football with girls who were quite well off. Yeah. I played football with girls who maybe weren't well off, but at the end of the day, we were at football, playing football together as a team, mm. as, as a collective, as a family. Mm. And that family feel and that relationship to build a safe space with a family that isn't your blood family is yeah. so, so special. And for me, that's the power of football and that's the power of sport. Mm. Okay, um, what I wanted to get into now was just the inequalities within the women's game. Um, so I see that you did team up with Sports Direct recently to talk yeah. about equal play. And just being someone who is just into football mad and just following what's going on, what have you observed that you think needs to change? A big issue in women's football is, is pay. And I think a lot of people assume that women footballers want what the men are earning. Mm. And I promise you, it couldn't be any further from the truth. They just want to be able to live comfortably and to be able to support themselves and not have to worry about paying for a house throughout their season yeah. or finding somewhere to live thinking, oh, is this too much or is this too much? Like. They just want to be able to do what they love and be comfortable. And if I'm being honest, I don't think they're asking for much. Mm. They're not asking to be early in... I don't even know what male football... It's crazy. It is. It is. But they just want to be comfortable and be able to play their sport and not have to pick up a second job. Yeah. Imagine, as a professional footballer, you've got girls picking up second jobs. It's mad. Do you think that there's ever going to come a point where women will actually be on the same level in terms of pay? Honestly, in my lifetime, probably not. Yeah. But it goes back to the girls don't want that. Like, yeah. it's, they're not asking for that. It goes back to what I've said. I think I would hope, <laughs> really, really hope, to know that in a few years, whether that be five years, ten years, the girls are in a position where they're, they're again, comfortable. Mm. But, you just never know. But mm. for me, someone who's passionate about the game and cares about the game, I want that to be there because I feel like that enables the game to grow to a next level as well. Because imagine playing your game and doing your work, but yeah. having all these other stresses. Yeah. Um, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying male footballers don't have things to stress about or to worry about. Mm. Like if you want to use Marcus Rashford at the moment, the stuff that he's doing is absolutely yeah, incredible. So he has so much more on his plate mm. than just football. Yeah. But he doesn't have to worry about his financial. Like I remember reading something where he bought his, he could buy his mum a house or he bought his mum this or that, which for me is amazing that he mm. could do that. And I respect that so much. 
but I don't think you'd see many female footballers being able to do that and I don't see that happening in the future mm. but it goes back to my point I'm I'm not saying they male footballers don't have anything to worry about yeah. but they're able to work on their passions or work on something that they want to really grow and get into yeah. without the stress of the financial backing no it's true it's very true um and even just recently as well because i know that with women's football i guess things are done differently the marketing is a bit different the way that the men's game is marketed compared to the females game i've noticed there's a bit of a difference there yeah. um and just recently i was scrolling on twitter and i saw a tweet from kirsty lynette on the Liverpool Women's FC and she just shared her experience that she was let go from the team after a few years of you know playing for them and it was quite abrupt she didn't have a face-to-face -face meeting um, I don't think she was told by the team itself she was informed by her agent and I know I saw that she put something about mental health and it just it strikes me in that instance that there's a lot of campaigns and organizations that will you know campaign for mental health yet they still, there's still blind spots where they treat people unfairly. What do you think just in relation to women's football and mental health? Um, like, because it's, 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 that's a bit out of pocket, in my yeah, opinion. Yeah, 100%. So in the women's game, I'm not sure if you know this or you don't know this, um, a lot of contracts are only one-year contracts. Okay. So that means there is a lot of stability and uncertainty to where the girls are going to be after that year. Mm which means that the girls, again, have a lot on their plate, so they need to know where they're going to go, where they're going to be, but they don't know unless they get offers in after the season ends. Yeah. So the girls themselves will have so many different worries, and if they're on a one-year contract, because of the lack of m money in women's football or only certain bigger, more noticeable players or players of a higher following or of a argued higher quality mm. as in like the big superstars mm. will only be the ones who get let's say a three four five year contract so even in the, the top division of women's football it's very rare that you get contracts longer than a year yeah. unless you're of a certain caliber which yeah. you fit into this caliber somehow um which obviously supporters etc etc don't have any control of it's how it is it within the market so for you to not even be told by your club that you're being released face to face in my opinion it's the least she deserves yeah the least yeah 100%. to be able to have that conversation mm. and f to make them aware and even to just show that they value her as a person yeah. and they respect her and as you said that's where it falls into mental health mental health is something that will affect everyone in their lifetime mm -hmm. whether it be on a severe factor or a really low factor yeah. or somewhere in the middle yeah no one can decide if something affects or doesn't affect someone mentally and yeah. you never know she might she might not be affected because she might be hard skinned but mm. at the same time she may really be affected like that and it yeah. could knock her confidence as yeah. not even as a footballer as a person i was just going to say like self esteem and confidence yeah. i think it's a big thing for everyone but especially being someone who's in the women's game yeah because even just being a part of the women's game is one thing do you know what i'm saying um yeah, I think that is just, yeah, there definitely needs to be improvements in terms of how things are handled. Um, so I wanted to kind of just get into your partnership with the Dalgarno Trust and just the things you're doing in the community for younger um, girls who may have not had opportunities that you've had growing yeah. up. Um, and just how do you actively empower younger females to play football and, you know, just get their head in the game? Yeah, so I recently, last year, last year during the first lockdown, I sat, I was sat in my room and I was like, I've sat on this idea for a while, I was like, I want to provide opportunities for young females. And I was like, who better to do it in West London than me? Pe as you said, like, yeah, people man. know me for playing football. <laughs> they know you for that. That's the first thing people yeah. ask me, you still playing football? <laughs> playing for the football team? But that's what people know me for and I love it and people are aware of that too. And mm. I was like... Why am I not providing opportunities for young females? It's big. Like, why am I not doing that? Mm. So I sat in my room and I was like, you know what? I'm going to start something. I'm going to start a community interest company. That's exactly it as well, because I think every, you, like, you want to leave a legacy. You want to be known for something. And exactly what you just said, that's what you're known for. Yeah. And that's the legacy, the trail that you're going to continue to leave. 
So even just the people that you have networked with, they remember you yeah. for that. And that is just massive in itself. In terms of um, females in sport who are laboring hard and may feel overlooked, again, this is kind of a mental health thing. What words do you have for women who are contributing and actively on the playing field who, m who may feel overlooked right now? Anything encouraging? I just think, not even on the pitch, I think in general, mm. for young females, young males, or people who just need that active boost or them words of encouragement, like, believe in yourself, you can do it, put, put the work in. Like, I work so hard, and again, I'm lucky because I'm working hard in something that I love so much mm. and I'm so passionate about, so sometimes it doesn't feel like work. But... I work hard because I believe in it and I believe in what I'm doing and I I have, again, a support system. Yeah. And you can always find a support system or yeah. people that want to help you. Like, I find sometimes that it's strangers that help you more than your own. But it's mad, it's different. Yeah. It's different. It, but, like, when you met... It goes back to you asking me and sending me a message to come on this. And the first thing... Genuinely, when I read it, I was like, oh, my God, like, I can't believe he's asked me, like, that's amazing. Mm. And without a shadow, I think I literally messaged you saying, of course I did. Yeah, yeah, you did. I was like, right, that was easy. Yeah, like literally. Because literally, like, there's times where I know that I'm going to have to network a bit hard to get yeah. yeses yeah. from people. Yeah, sometimes you'll get yeses, sometimes you'll get no, sometimes yeah. you have to work for it. But for me, I believe in what you're doing and mm. there would be no reason for me not coming and being a part of this for you. Yeah. Because I'm, I do it because I believe in you as a person yeah. and again you're like family so why would I not help someone out who wants to do something and again privileged to even be off so I was like wow yeah of course like <laughs> this is this is great someone asking me to be involved but Mad. sometimes you'll have to network harder sometimes you yeah. won't but you will always find that there's someone that does believe in you and you might not see it straight away but you will find them people along the way and you'll be lucky because you'll have maybe two three four or five people who really back what you do and mm. They know people who know people who know mm. people who know people. Mm. And your your support and your network and your comfort blanket becomes bigger and stronger as you go. Yeah, see it there. You guys are hearing it direct <laughs> from Nancy. She's spitting too much gems right now, so there's big things going on in the business right now. So in the next, I guess, coming years, who are the, pe the young upcoming players that we should watch out for? Because I know that with what Karima was telling me is that in men's football, like you'll know about the young stars that are up and coming, but you won't really hear of them in women's football. Yeah, I think there are a lot of hidden gems in women's football, like across the board, like not mm. even just in England. I think a few players for me that are that are on my radar that I know about that are actually like getting first team football or in the first team and still quite young. Like you've got people like Asmita Ayl, who is at Aston Villa, she's a quality player, mm. like she's a really good player. Mm. Um, you've got the likes of like Maisie Barker, who's at West Ham, but she's also like family to me. So okay. her playing and getting first team football and me seeing that and me knowing her, like I was literally with her the other day mm. and I saw her and like, I was just like, this is amazing. Like she's so determined and she mm. so wants to do it and she works hard. And she's obviously on my radar where I've got a bias for her, but yeah. she is genuinely yeah. a really good player as yeah. well. You've got the likes of even girls who are already in the England squad and still really young, like your Esme Morgans, mm. your Lauren Hemp's. You've got Georgia Stanways to still quite young. You've got, but they're they're established now. Like okay. they are established yeah. players. But when they were first coming up, you was like, wow, like these are young girls who are getting first team football. Like Lauren James incredible baller like um it's amazing to think like she's got such a talented family mm. like reese james is her brother but okay. imagine being able like growing up with your brother and two of you are now like really really respected footballers mm. like imagine they're kicking ball sessions <laughs> in their back garden could you imagine yeah, just like right. kicking ball with your brother or your sister and you're both big time brothers. Imagine, no, like, imagine the sessions. Like, <laughs> it'd just be going hard, like, yeah, battling yeah. each other. Yeah, but 100. there are so many players mm. that are making names for themselves. Like, Lauren James, I, I really want to see her do well. You've got the likes of, like, Ella Toon. Again, she's at Man United. She's already making a name for herself. 
see all the names that are just flowing. Like Nancy knows her <laughs> game, you know. There's just they, these are quite established players, yeah. though, to be fair. But then you've got the likes of girls that I work with. So when I did the stuff with the BBC, I worked with three young ballers. Mm. Um, so I worked with Jessica Wallace, who's at West Ham. She's super young. Uh, Melis Mamet, who's at Arsenal. Quality, that one. She's sick. Quality she's baller. Sick. Yeah, wicked girl as yeah. well. Then uh, Georgia Fox, who's at Chelsea, but she's going out to America. She, incredible player. Hard. But those three players, I was there kicking ball with them and mm. I was like, you lot are something special. So, and to be able to work with them, I can't see, can't wait to like see their journey and mm. follow it. So moving on from that point, if there's anything, anything that you wish to achieve in the women's game, what would it be? That's such a hard question. Just because I do so much within the women's game, honestly. Like when someone asks me what I do, I'm like, oh, I do this, I do this, I do this, yeah, I do this. I do yeah. this. I'm like, oh, what do I do? <laughs> um, for me, I really, I want to platform the women's game. I want to make sure that the women's game, when they think of women's football, they think of someone like me who's mm. really putting her passion into it and helping it grow. And also allowing young females to know that even if you don't want to be a footballer or you don't necessarily like football, mm. hopefully with what I'm doing with Outside of the Box, you can come to my sessions and be someone that, like you can drop me a message on Instagram or Twitter yeah. or TikTok or whatever you use or email and sort of reach out to me and ask for, ask for advice and hopefully I can help. Um, I'm not saying I'm the most important person yeah. or I'm, I'm a big inspirational figure, but I get young people messaging me sometimes asking for advice and it genuinely like makes my day. Mm. And the fact that people feel like my words can help them feel better about themselves mm. or can enable them to have an understanding of the women's footballing world is is incredible. So I hope to be a person who can continue to help inspire mm. young females, young males to be the best that they can be, whether that's in football or around football or even something wider than that. Yeah. It's just hopefully yeah. being a person who can help and and aid in any yeah. way possible because yeah. sometimes you just need someone to talk to yeah. or someone to say you can do it yeah definitely so where can the people who are viewing at home keep up to date with you and everything you're doing and message you for any advice or anything oh, now i've got to remember my <laughs> my, my social network direct it there so at nance baker so like n-a-n-c-e-b-a-k-e-r underscore is my twitter instagram my Twitter is the same, but just no underscore at the end. Okay. And then for any young females aged 8 to 16 who want to utilise outside the box and get involved, or even yeah. anyone who wants to volunteer or be a part of it or come and help, it's OTB underscore football on Instagram. Um, but yeah, hopefully people will see my face here and there and get involved. And yeah, I'm, I'm someone who I don't mind helping, I mm. think. It's, it's nice to be nice and you never know helping someone, they goes might be able way. to help you. Yeah, it goes a long way. So this has been amazing. <laughs> Thank you so much for coming today. I've not seen you for years, but this has been just such a blessing and an honour just to be able to interview you. And yeah, to everyone that's watching, it's a wrap. We're done. But yeah, keep it tuned. Keep it locked. The business. <laughs>